Hello, this is Jimmy Putnam, the host of the Jimmy Curve podcast, and welcome to our pilot episode. This is uh, our first release of the Jimmy Curve podcast, so what you're going to be hearing today is mostly myself and co-hosts Joshua Vossler and Will Doherty trying to sort of organically figure out our dynamic while talking amongst ourselves about whatever pops into our heads. Uh, hopefully, as we go on and release more episodes, we'll develop more of a standard format and something uh, that people are more used to hearing, but we thought we'd go ahead and release this anyway and let everyone give it a listen. So thanks for listening. Thanks for downloading. Thanks for streaming. Whatever you're doing, we really appreciate it. Enjoy. Okay, welcome to the Jimmy Curve episode. Who knows? We don't know when we're posting them yet, but... This is an episode of The Jimmy Curve. My name is Jimmy Putnam, and with me is... Joshua Vossler. And... Will Doherty. So we're going to be talking about some stuff that's on our minds. Uh, but first, I just wanted to introduce the the panel. Are we a panel? Are we a group? Are we a quorum? I would say that Will and I are co-hosts, and you're the host. Oh, God. I, I didn't want to say that because it I gets me excited. It, I, I just said it, I just said it. I know. <laughs> And now it's now it's out there. Now it exists. I am. Hold on. Hold on. Co-host. <laughs> I. You can't give me power. You can't hand me a big sword like that. I'm gonna fucking swing it. We're in your basement using <laughs> all your equipment, and we're on the Jimmy Curve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am the host of the Jimmy Curve, Jimmy Putnam. I uh, assume get on the Jimmy Curve is what you tell your wife when you need to get boned. <laughs> <laughs> It wasn't before, <laughs> but it's gonna be now. All right. Your co-host just made your life a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> and my wife's a little bit more awkward. So this is the Jimmy Curve Podcast. I'm the host, Jimmy Putnam. My co-hosts are Josh and Will, or Will and Josh, depending on what order you like them. And I thought I'd start out by introducing the concept of the Jimmy Curve and explaining what it is. Uh... So the Jimmy Curve started out uh, when I created a, a bell curve, uh, which is essentially a, a, a chart that measures the quality of a person with uh, on the X axis uh, is intelligence and on the Y axis is having your shit together. The idea being that the smarter a person is, the more they have their shit together. But at a certain point, you reach the peak of the curve, and it starts to fall back off. The smarter you get, you start misplacing your keys. You're always late to everything, uh, and your life starts getting more and more chaotic till the point where the smartest people you know, their lives are just as insanely chaotic as the dumbest people you know. Like at the start of the Jimmy Curve, those are your homeless junkies and professional athletes, basically. Like you can give them a million dollars – Life still completely messed up. You know, the far end of the Jimmy Curve, uh, those are your Albert Einsteins, you know, and your Richard Feynmans who, you, you know, can't organize a sketch. Like, Albert Einstein could never remember his own address. He could never find his house keys. He just, he had to have people do that for him so that he could think about stuff. You know, I am, <laughs> I, of course, am at the peak of the Jimmy Curve, known as the sweet spot. AKA the nexus of mm. uh, having your shit together. So uh, that's the concept of the Jimmy curve. And uh, it's going to be uh, essentially the way that uh, I will judge everyone on this podcast. So uh, where do you feel like you fall on the Jimmy curve, Josh? Uh, right in the sweet spot with you, man. <laughs> right up in there. <laughs> Right in the sweet spot. I, I, I like how you're saying that. Uh, I like the tone you used, and I like the confidence with, with, uh, with which it came out. Uh, Will, where do, where do you see yourself on the Jimmy Curve? Um, First of all, are you two buying into the concept of the Jimmy Curve? I mean, I get it. It totally makes sense mm -hmm. uh, because and, – and I know exactly where I am at. Uh, I am I am heedlessly tumbling down the far side of the Jimmy <laughs> Curve. Like, it sounds arrogant to say, but I'm, like, too smart to live. <laughs> uh, like, I had – I got uh, super high test scores in school. 
uh, but I still work at Pizza Hut and am 28. Yeah. So, yeah. so far, this podcast is the most significant thing I've accomplished in my life. Ugh. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized something when you were describing the podcast. Yeah. Like, I just realized, like, it had, like, you're the host and we're two co hosts. Like, this is basically the Nerdist if all three of the guys in the Nerdist were Matt Myra. <laughs> well, let's talk about, let's talk about that because that's interesting. Uh, off the air before we started, Josh, you brought up something that was kind of interesting. Um, I should mention that we are all comedians local comedians in the lincoln nebraska area uh in the or in the greater nebraska area in general i think that lincoln and omaha is one comedy scene i feel sometimes uh much as it tries to separate itself the so, southeast nebraska right comedy. so <laughs> by no means are any of us professional comedians uh will you've been at it the longest and have flown the closest to the sun uh, <laughs> right of the three of us and indeed, those wax wings didn't last for long. <laughs> <laughs> so you've been doing uh, you've been doing stand up comedy for how long? Uh, probably six years now or so. Okay, six Pretty years. Regularly. Uh, you've you've dipped your toes into the murky, murky Chicago comedy water. Uh, found it too cold, and come back to Lincoln. Um, well, for a variety of other like personal failures, right. it wasn't just the comedy scene. Although I did find it indeed too cold. Mm -hmm. Also shark infested. Uh, Josh, uh, you've been... I've been doing it uh, in October. It'll be two years. Okay. And uh, so uh, not as long as the master here. <laughs> yes. Everyone, but, uh, everyone, please defer to the guy who's been failing the longest. <laughs> well, I mean, after six years of comedy, you've become a co-host on someone's pilot podcast so <laughs> which who, makes who, which makes sense if you measure the level of anger between the two of us you could obviously tell six year comic correct year and a half comic i would argue that i may be the angriest among us and i've been doing it for less than one year that's just the personality i was trait. born with that though <laughs> you can't teach my anger i i've been doing stand-up comedy for one year uh i've been improvising for a little bit longer than that through the backline improv theater i've been doing that for about two years um, I've also dabbled in sketch. I just wrote and directed a, a sketch at a live sketch show that went very well. Yes. Applause. And actually it, it, to this point, uh, it's the thing I'm most proud of doing because it went great. Uh, so there's no evidence of it. You'll just have to take my word. Uh, so as local comedians, we also have other things in common. I find interesting that we're three... Lincoln Comics, and we're all married. I right. find that interesting. What percentage of local Lincoln Comics are married, would you say? Uh, 8%? And they're like all in this room. I, it's got to be higher than that, because how many actual Lincoln Comics are there? Like, I feel like three makes it like 30%, because That's it's true. out of the 10 or so. Right. <laughs> well, what do we define? Let's talk about that. What do we define as a comic? Oh, Certainly. good. I thought you were going to say, let's define marriage. And I'm like, that's a whole different ball of wax. <laughs> yeah. Leave uh, that to the Supreme Court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what do you define as a comic? Like, what do you call a comic or a comedian? Does somebody who – certainly somebody who's done one open mic in their life, you wouldn't call that person a comedian. But a person who does – an open mic once a week for three months? Is that person a comedian? I would say like a comedian is somebody who is is making an effort to do it regularly. Okay. And that I think you also have to have some inkling of, you know, there has to be some level of improvement or the possibility of improving. <laughs> At least the possibility right. to become better. Okay. Because you can you can do you can do an open mic you can do Duffy's mm -hmm. every Monday, mm -hmm. which is a local mm -hmm. open mic. It's it's mm -hmm. the thing to do in Lincoln as far as open mics. There are certainly people who've been doing that for six months and are the same. Six months. There are people who've been doing that for fifteen years <laughs> and are and are not better. <laughs> right. No more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, to me, that is. Uh, I think there has to be a level of potential for 
success. And when I say success, as I mean like killing on a show. Mm-hmm. I don't mean success in the in the broader Getting sense. Paid. I mean success in comedy is making people laugh. Right. And if you call yourself a comic and you're coming into Duffy's every Monday and eating shit on stage mm-hmm. and not doing anything to change that, that I have a hard time having that person call themselves a comedian. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess this is kind of an interesting discussion because this isn't like – an argument that I had with my wife because she was trying to convince me because like basically what I have said is like I stop myself whenever I'm about to refer to myself as a comedian because I feel like I need to remember like no I'm just an asshole who lives in Nebraska like a comedian <laughs> is a person who's making a living you know I and yeah and, well, and and she was like offended by that but, um and she just graduated with an English degree and she's going on to grad school in English and she like considers herself a writer and she writes and she like f- took personal offense to that idea it's like mm-hmm. i i have written stories i've had things like published in local you know like the school magazines and whatnot and i call myself a writer and i think that's a useful thing to do and you should do the same and i'm like Ugh, but there's so like it goes the other way because there's so many douchebags who just like refer to themselves yeah. as a comedian and i want to just fight against it from that side I would argue that that's the difference between professional comedian and amateur comedian and semi-professional comedian. I, I think that's what uh, professional means is you're I, – I would call professional whatever it is you're doing. You are making a living. Your primary income that you live off of is at that. Semi-professional means you do get some compensation, but maybe it's not your primary income or enough to live on. And pro. Right. Yeah. What? And pro, like, and, like golf. Okay, see, I was going to make a sports reference. Like, <laughs> you, if you go out and play basketball every weekend with your buddies, you're a basketball player. Mm. You're not a professional basketball player, even a semi-professional basketball player, but you're certainly more of a basketball player than me. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I think that doing a thing regularly makes you – now, going out and shooting free throws in your driveway one day does not a basketball player make, but if you – Play basketball. You're a basketball player. I would say that's true of comic. Like, I struggled with this when I was a musician uh, in what seems like another lifetime, a.k.a. college. So that would have been – I'm 36. So from the ages of 18 until 24, I was a musician. And I always struggled with do I call myself a musician, do I not? Well, I I reached a certain level of competence – to where I just felt comfortable referring to myself as a musician. And at one point I realized that we, our band just wasn't playing for free anymore. You know, sometimes we only got 50 bucks or something for a show, but we still didn't play for free. And I was like, Hey, we're like a semi-professional band because people are paying us to do our thing. And that felt really good. So I would say the same is true of comedy. Uh, if you get paid, some of the time to do it you're a semi-professional comedian comedian nonetheless i mean like you can be a comedian and never get paid because to me being a comedian is somebody who makes people laugh sure you can make youtube videos that are hilarious and has the ability to make people laugh on any sort of regular basis you have people that call themselves comedians and rarely make people laugh to me that's it's i can't imagine you know saying i'm a comedian but i Mm -hmm. you know i rarely make people laugh but you're a comedian why because you have the the gumption to get up on stage and then not make people laugh that doesn't make you a comedian right right you know well that was an interesting thing in the movie uh, man in a man in the man on the moon the andy kaufman thing Mm. where he kept saying over and over i'm not a comedian because like he wasn't going for laughs that wasn't his thing he was a prankster practical joker provocateur whatever he was he performance artist it was very important to him that he was not called a comedian because to him comedian meant you're trying to make people laugh and he felt like that was easy (laughs) which is insult it's not but you know that that was his take on it uh yeah I, i i think we're all on the same page on that basically it's certainly not interesting to anyone listening to sit here, sit around and define comedian as I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> it seems very interesting to me to dissect it. I mean, if I, that's one of the things with me and anything I'm doing. One of my biggest problems in life is I 
my my tendency is I will sit around and talk shop and discuss theory all day and never do anything. I'm always doing that with my improv teams. You know, they always want to like practice and play and get a topic and and play and like do stuff. And I'm like, let's discuss what went wrong in that last show and let's break down each decision that everyone made. <laughs> And what better choices you could have made, you know, let's talk about blocking, let's talk about form, let's talk about theory. And then all of my friends who do improv with me are just like, shut up, like, God damn it, let's just well, tell jokes. Well, to take it back to uh, uh, sports, as I know you're going to do to me endlessly, <laughs> uh, it's kind of the difference between watching the game footage and actually practicing, right. like, on the field. Well, and to get good at sports, you need both. Right. I think that that's one of the things that frustrates me about people in comedy sometimes is <clears throat> it's like everybody wants to just go out and play. Everybody and everybody gets bored with practice quickly at everything. That's true of anything in life. At anything in life, practice will make you better and game planning will make you better. Whether it's comedy, whether it's sports, whatever it is, some people are born and they grow to be six foot eight at the age of 15 and they can dunk a basketball and they're the best player uh, in junior high school. But that that doesn't mean that you can play against collegiate players, or especially not pros. You still need coaching. You still need to learn fundamentals and you need to learn how to run an offense. And you might just not have it and I, it might not be for you. Right. You know, I, I don't care how much I play basketball, I play it five hours a day every day. I'll never become right a basketball player. There's no way. Right. Same thing with with comedy. Some people, it's not for everyone. That makes that bring that reminds me of an interesting idea that I am constantly fascinated with, which is people who have an extreme talent for one thing but don't enjoy it, and you see it in sports from time to time. Like one of the most famous examples is Ryan Leaf. Ryan Leaf was the number two overall pick in the NFL draft in, I don't know, 99 or something like that. It was a while ago. Uh, it was drafted by the San Diego Chargers. He played, <clears throat> I don't remember where he played his college ball, but he just had a cannon. I mean, the guy was 6'5", 230, solid, chiseled, with just a cannon for an arm. Accuracy, everything, could read defenses. The guy hated playing football. He just didn't like it. Todd Marinovich is another guy like that. They called him Robo Quarterback. I don't know if you remember Todd Marinovich, but he was this guy who, when he was 18, all these stories came out. I mean, he was drafted in like the 80s, I think. And he was his dad was his his high school coach, and he had never eaten a cheeseburger. Like his dad had controlled his diet and his workout regimen his entire life. Like the guy had never had any kind of you know, like, like he, I think he'd never had sugar or something in his life. And he was just this guy who was this bizarre physical specimen. And he went to play in the NFL. And after two years, like had just washed out. Cause he, he had finally gotten out on his own and he just sort of wanted to drink and do drugs and like get laid. And he never, he just didn't want to play football. Is that thing true of comedy? Have you ever met a comedian who is super funny, naturally gifted at stand-up, and just doesn't want to do it? I've never seen it. I, I mean, I've met funny people, you know, that have a natural ability to be funny, off the cuff, quick, but uh, they'll never get on stage. It's a... Uh, it's, you know, That's it's, a, it's a different animal right. being on stage and, and just you and the mic and trying to get people to laugh. That's different right. than, you know, telling dick jokes with your friends. Well, I think the difference is that no one ever pushes anyone or rarely pushes anyone into a career in comedy. It's almost entirely self-driven. You get people get pushed into careers in sports. People get people get forced into like things like law degrees. I mean, there are people who are fourth generation attorneys and can't stand doing the work but their dad's their father's father was an attorney and they've gone through law school i worked with a guy like that well i, I worked mean, i worked with a guy his dad was an attorney and he had so much pressure to become an attorney he got a law degree passed the bar exam and never became an attorney yeah. he was working with me so right. it's like you know he, well that could like, have been me i mean i would have been a fourth generation attorney or third generation attorney 
my sister is a lawyer. My dad's a lawyer. My grandfather was a lawyer. And like I was, but they didn't really pressure me that much. It was encouraged for certain, but I knew very early on before I even enrolled in law school, like this is not for me. There's no way I'm going to be able to do this. You're just wasting your money. So, but, but that does happen. It doesn't happen in comedy. You don't get on stage and tell jokes unless you want to. Well, and, and the only way, the only way that you end up having a career in comedy, like it's not like it's handed down from father to son, mm -hmm. you know, like you become a partner right. in the law firm. Like you have to put in years of right. bu bullshit toil <laughs> to get to the point where you have something that could be called a career in comedy. Mm -hmm. Like you, you have to desire that greatly for most people. Well, one of the things about comedy that uh, that has also struck me is interesting. And I think this explains why, because we've all been to open mics and seen people get up on stage with nothing and they just get up there and think they're, think they're just going to riff and it's going to be great. And you go, what, what was going through this person's head that they thought this was going to happen? And I think I know what it is, which is that comedy when done right, doesn't look like anything. Like, no one watches NASCAR and goes, Psh, I could do that. Like, even if you don't, like, I, don't, I can't stand NASCAR, but I recognize that it's incredibly difficult to drive 200 miles an hour six inches from another car and not die. Like, oh, really? Because takes... I watch NASCAR and I'm like, oh, I can drive. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm like, ah, oh, pretty rough life. But, uh, you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I don't get NASCAR either. I just I, it's right. dumb. But can, but can you but can you drive that fast that close to another car for six hours without blinking? That's the challenge. Hmm. With a catheter in. I don't know, man. <laughs> so I got a speeding ticket once. But if so, you, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> so, but if you see a comedian up on stage, it doesn't look like anything. It's like, oh, that guy's up there. He's drunk. He's just. He's talking about his dick. Like, it doesn't... Like, you don't see the hours and uh, that go into what... that To that five oh, yeah. minutes. The, uh, the the years, sometimes, that go into that five minutes. You know, you just think, well, that guy's just up there screwing around. I can do that. Yeah, really great comedy generally does. Like, it seems effortless. Right. No one watches LeBron James and is like, Psh. I think there. that's why there's a that. tendency for really drunk people to just get up and do something for the first time on stage it's because it's like pff, i've seen people do comedy i'm really drunk and people laugh at me when i'm drunk <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna get up on stage and mm -hmm. i'll do comedy mm -hmm. and they they usually eat shit I they usually suck they're usually annoying nobody likes them yeah 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 oh i always my i really just make my friends laugh all the time that's the that's the line you hear all the time yeah so josh uh you're you've been doing comedy for a couple years how old are you i'm 29. All right. You're married and what are you really married? Huh? I'm super married. Super. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difference between married and super married? Like, can't, can't get out of it. Yeah, no. If, I'm you're trapped. Super, if you're super married, you're fucked. Yeah, I can't get out of this. <laughs> I dug a really deep hole. I'm in it. All right. Uh, and what does your wife do? My wife is a science, high school science teacher. If I asked your wife, what's her name? Alicia. If I asked Alicia, what do you think of Josh's comedy career? What would she say? <laughs> she would say, uh, uh, he likes that. <laughs> <laughs> he likes doing that stuff. <laughs> I've never seen her <laughs> like one time. I yeah, think, she's she's a little like she she's seen a handful of shows, I, mm -hmm. I would say, mm -hmm. you know, and I think. Um, Brad Stewart's always talking about her. She's like, she's the worst audience member. She's hard to make <laughs> laugh. You know what I mean? Right. And, uh, that's true. Um, she is. And I, I think it's really hard for me to make her laugh because I am bothering her all the time. Just, right. you know, personality wise, <laughs> like she's annoyed. So she's not going to want to come see me be annoying on stage when she gets all that at home. Uh, <laughs> right. but, uh, yeah, super married. What do you do for work? <laughs> Uh, when right. you're outside I, of comedy, I mean, obviously I'm you're a professional. A, I'm a 29 year old full time student right now. Yeah, I do part time security work, uh, and uh, yeah. But you're a former police officer, 
And yeah, I don't bring it up. Uh, I'm actually currently a prison certif- guard, surf- certified law enforcement officer. I do part time uh, uh, sheriff's deputy work still. I was a cop full time for six years, and uh, I usually don't bring it up because it's cops. You know. Cops and comedy. Cops ain't funny. Yeah. It's usually, <laughs> I was responsible for Cops ruining good times for six years. So can you? Can but now, you, I, now I just do yeah. part-time security work, um, off-duty security work, and and you know sporadic law enforcement uh, stuff to fill in a uh, sheriff's office. So. Can Can you give us one story uh, that happened when you were a cop, like? A full time cop. Uh, Some, just something crazy or funny or I I I think I can, yeah. I uh I was there was a we uh were responding to somebody coming out from a different county and that county wanted that person stopped and uh for like uh domestic assault, uh terrorism uh uh with a with a weapon. So this is a guy who was like terrorized on the somebody road. with a weapon, uh and was supposedly drunk and it was a it was a big deal. He was on the run. Yeah, he fled that county gotcha. after committing a crime. And we uh, – actually, my partner found him in the northern part of the county and uh, stopped him. And he did pull over, but the guy was totally wasted. And uh, the guy was supposedly an Army Ranger and had a lot of experience in combat and stuff like that. And he supposedly – the report was that he had a gun. Right. And so we were – you know – kind of high high alert situation we had him stopped and and uh uh the guy got out of the car and wasn't following directives well i show up state trooper shows up and uh the guy wasn't following directives at all we were just going to take him into custody uh for you know and figure out what is communicate what with mean, the other county following directives uh basically you know like turn put your around hands on the car, put your hands right. up you know base stuff yeah. you see on you know basic yeah. Cop commands, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and uh, your, your basic, your the basic... guy was very aggressive in right. his language, and and uh, he ended up uh, sitting on the uh, trunk of his car, and we're like, we're gonna have to do something. This guy's not following directives, mm-hmm. and we're gonna have to approach this guy. But we were on edge, you know, because mm-hmm. the, he supposedly had a gun and he was wearing like a coat. Right. Um, and so we go up on the guy and I come up from kind of the side behind him. And as he's yelling and screaming, he actually takes off his coat, which is a good thing because my plan was like, I'm going to tase him, <laughs> right? you know? <laughs> so, uh, you know, we, we approach the guy, come from like the side behind and, um, I tase him right? and it works. That, right. you know, nine times out of ten, Taser is right. going to work if you get a good shot and get the guy. He, But I thought he would just kind of fall off the trunk, mm-hmm. and he didn't. So he's just, like, laying on the on the <laughs> trunk of the car while right. being tased. So I take my free hand, and I take his arm, and I pull him off, and he falls on the ground. We get on top of him, and we cuff him. Nobody gets hurt. It's great. Right. And then soon as... uh. Every, you know, we get our bearings and everything like this. This guy's like, I think I shit myself. We thought, we thought yeah, well, you, you know. Yeah. And uh, sure He's enough, you uh, well, we, we, we pat the guy down and we put him in my patrol vehicle. You know, we don't think much of it. Yeah, he totally shit himself. <laughs> <laughs> and we put him in my patrol car. And I know, it, tasers, I've been tased. Yeah. Tasers won't cause you to defecate on yourself i actually think it was when i pulled him off the trunk of the car and he hit the ground i think i knocked something loose right you know (laughs) let's let's do let's do let's do a let's do a quick recreation of this situation i'm gonna play the belligerent drunk guy you're gonna play you and will is gonna play the guy that i've got in the trunk of the car all right, so I'm. I'm you have him in the trunk. Yeah, I got Will. That's in a the, really big trunk. Yeah, Will's. In the, <laughs> <laughs> it's a four door sedan. Okay, it's a set. It's a 1970s Cadillac. So, uh, all right, so, <laughs> all right, so, so I'm on the trunk of my car. So, uh, Will, you can start us off. <laughs> hey, 
What do you want, officer? Sir, put your hands up. I'm so full. Sir, put your hands up. I'm so full. <laughs> Get off the trunk. I've just been, I've been eating so much food today. Taser, taser, taser. <laughs> oh, God. All right, that's a that's, that's <laughs> reason. And scene. <laughs> okay. So that's... Okay. So let's all talk about the choices we made there. <laughs> I think it might have been a mistake for me to be gagged in that scene. <laughs> I, yeah, well, I, I was I was so caught up in justifying the end of the scene, I forgot to play my character. Right. So, <laughs> uh, but I, I I feel that that was a was that a, a pretty accurate description of what? Um, well, first of all, I don't I don't know know if I made it sound like there was somebody in the trunk. <laughs> There was no. n- there was nobody in no, the trunk. I, I took some liberties with the situation. Okay, you made it better. You made right. the story he better. He wrote he wrote in a part for it's me. Called, yeah, it's, it's called dramatic license. Yeah, so it wasn't accurate at all, but it was, <laughs> <laughs> it was entertaining. Right, it was the movie version of what yeah. had happened. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so now let's talk to Will Doherty a little bit. Oh no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I don't like Let's it any away, more than you do. Put away all the sharp objects. God, we shouldn't have been drinking for this. All right. Will, lay it on us. Where are you from? Why do you do what you do? Um, I We're I'm, mocking Will because Will claims to be perpetually depressed and unhappy with his life. I, I hold that Will's life is not that bad. My life is like... It's not that bad, but only in the way that, like, I feel like I'm not allowed to feel guilty because Africa still exists. <laughs> like, that's the only way my life isn't that bad. Well, I'll tell you what. I am going to walk over to my mini fridge and get a beer, but I would like you to give us a quick description of uh, your history with stand-up comedy. Okay. Um, so to answer the previous questions, I'm I'm from Nebraska. I'm from the rule as fuck Nebraska. Uh, it's Page, Nebraska, which there's literally like maybe 300 people on the earth who know where that is. Right. So, and probably four of them are the people listening to this. So <laughs> I guess it's still okay to say it. Um, uh, I've like always wanted to do... Um, comedy in some degree. Like when I was a little kid, I would draw like, like I read like Calvin and Hobbes and like comic, like newspaper comics. And I would draw that shit. And I always wanted to like do something. And when I got into high school, I realized I could do stand up comedy and that didn't require work. <laughs> uh, like you didn't have to have any talent. You just said stuff. And that was the whole process. And I think that's what really draws me to stand up comedy. Uh, I must. Uh, I, I I take issue with one, stand-up comedy is an incredible amount of work. It is. <laughs> it is. But like, and and it's Improv difficult. Improv requires almost no work if you want to do it terribly. Like it requires work if you want to do it well. But most people do improv because you literally don't have to prepare and you can still do it. Sure. But stand-up that you you can't. Like you have to prepare a lot. That's true, um, and I guess it's just that my the way I do stand up feels very lazy to me. Okay. Um, because like it's not that I don't do the work. I get I get as much stage time as I can. I I prepare it. I, I I'm not one of those guys who like just goes on stage with no material. Like I have material, but I also don't really do any physical writing of stuff. Like I don't write my material material ahead of time. I just roll shit around in my head a bunch when I'm doing whatever I'm doing for the day. So like that's the that's that's my only process, and that's why I feel like and – th- and that's the other part. Like that's why I say I, I'm drawn to stand-up because it's not work. It's not that it's not work. It's just that by the time you've gotten on stage, you've already done the comedy. Right. Like I – like recording a podcast can be comedy and it can be the same type of thing except that you have to – there's like all the other shit. You got to set up the wires and you got to have some microphones mm-hmm. and you got to mm-hmm. edit it and you got to put it out on Libsyn. <laughs> there's steps. Yeah. Uh, the, the other group of people that I hear describe their craft like that are fighters. Like, mixed martial artists will always say, the fight is nothing. <laughs> the hard part is training. Like, you spend hours every day going around, working out, sparring, boxing in the gym. They Like, most of them will say, by the time we get to the fight... All that happens is some guy punches me in the face for 15 minutes. That's nothing compared to, like, the last six months leading up to this, which was just pure hell. 
Like, the fight is fun. Like, you've already done your work, and the fight is won a week before the fight. Like, they'll tell right. you they know who's going to win just because they know who's tra- – you know, they know who sort of sprained a knee four months ago and had to start their training over and who's peaking at the right time. I would say a better analogy Jace, just based on, like, monetary – value would be like a magician that works really hard on his tricks yeah, all right. for the <laughs> eighth like jimmy's eighth birthday party show you yeah. know like he yeah. he works really hard and then in you know for the big payoff right. you know the big payoff mm-hmm. at least if you lose like an mma fight you're still gonna make a lot of money and right. you were on national tv and you got a shot at one of those ring girls. Like there's, <laughs> there's some. At, well, at the highest level, I mean, <laughs> right? I, I, MMA and comedy work on the same levels. Like there's local. Right. Your first fights are for a hundred bucks if you win. Right. So yeah, it's the same I mean, type but of deal. you get laid. But you do get laid if more. you're a magician or a comic. Good luck. Oh no, fighters get laid way more. Yeah, I, I've got to imagine. Uh, so Will, if I asked your wife Serenity. Uh, what do you think of Will's comedy career? What would she say? Um, it's hard for me to gauge what she would actually say. Mm-hmm. Um, that can swing a lot uh, day to day. But I will say in the Broadway, like, she's very supportive. Mm-hmm. And, like, she likes, like, she seems to enjoy, like, she comes out a fair bit um, to shows. Uh, and she watches a lot, and she does stand up from time to time, mm-hmm. uh, even though like it. And just because she wants to have the experience of having like gotten on stage and told jokes and worked on material, um, because she wants to just kind of know what my experience mm-hmm. is like in she's some way. Pretty good. I've seen her. She. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> she's all right. <laughs> uh, so, what do you do for money? Um, uh, I uh take people their pizzas and then hope that they choose to give me money mm. even though they don't have to mm. yeah it's a uh, i i'll tell you i was a professional pizza delivery driver for four years right well i, know I, that, I hey. feel like there are no amateur delivery drivers right. per se that's right yeah <laughs> hey listen man the pie game's not for the weak of heart that's some intense shit give us some funny or interesting story that happened when you were delivering pizzas. Okay. Well, th- this is just a little factoid. Um, recently, the pizza... Oh, should I say the name? Uh, I don't care. They're not going to fucking listen to this or sue me. The Pizza Hut that I work at. Um, recently, like, we had a couple of drivers get robbed. It wasn't me. But, coincidentally, that means that they now will no longer deliver to the neighborhood I live in <laughs> after 9 p.m. <laughs> Which, I mean, in a way, does also totally make sense because I do steal shit a lot. So <laughs> I get it. What does what does robbery of a pizza driver consist of in this part of the world? Is it, does it involve guns? Uh, yeah, I, it does involve guns, wow. which they made a point of telling me. Because apparently that's what made it real. Like, they've had people get knocked over for their pizzas before. Mm. I don't think they've ever... I'd, I don't know if this one they've ever lost any money. I mean, I'm sure they have at some point, but, like, recently. Um, but, yeah, apparently this time there were guns out, so that's why... Uh, Jesus. That's why they're not going back to <laughs> E and F Street. <laughs> <laughs> Where is the Pizza Hut that you work at? Um, Coddington and West Day. It's in a, like, gotcha. strip mall with a... Or not strip mall, but, like, in a Russ's Market. Gotcha. So, uh, give us a story about something that happened to you. So, uh, I, there are, I want to say three strip clubs in my delivery area. Uh, and I've taken to all of them at least once. I think like the favorite thing like that happened, this is actually the first time I took a delivery to a strip club, uh, It was actually the first time I'd ever been inside a strip club, Mm -hmm. which I was kind of pissed at them for stealing from me Mm -hmm. because I was already like 26 years old or something at the time. And I realized like I hadn't gone between 21 and 26. And at that point, I was just kind of saving it. Right. I was like, oh, man, someday, like when I'm 40 and just off the first divorce, (laughs) like I'm going to walk into a strip club for the first time. And that's just going to like condense an entire David Lynch movie into like one heap of sadness. Yep. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I didn't 
didn't make it that far because I had to take a pizza up there. Um, but what happened, and this was so sweet and so thoughtful, but also so insecure of this <laughs> stripper, which makes sense. Of course. Um, it was like a split bill, which happens sometimes mm -hmm. when, uh, you know, shifty people don't have money. Uh, it was like half, uh, half the like charges on a credit card. And then it was like, they're going to pay the other half in cash. Mm hmm. But this, when I got there, the stripper who was paying for it, like, gave me the half of the payment that was in cash, but then, like, made a big, like, thing to say, like, here, I'm giving you a tip, but I'm writing your tip on your credit card. And I'm like, the money is all going back into the common pool. Like, I'll just take <laughs> your ass dollars. It doesn't matter. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> it's fine. Nice. But, yeah, but, I mean, I guess she's being thoughtful, or maybe she actually had, like chlamydia or something and was actually like being thoughtful i don't know <laughs> all right so now what we're gonna do is recreate this transaction <laughs> you're gonna be you you're approaching the outside door of the strip club right. i'm going to play the bouncer at the door and uh josh is going to uh be in the trunk of my car <laughs> <laughs> no josh is josh is going to play the stripper okay so you're so as will is approaching uh, so you're not there yet. I am the bouncer at the door, right? All right. So what am I supposed to do? Just like you'll 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 know when the a time stripper. Comes. So just say dumb shit. <laughs> <laughs> right. Got it. It'll come to you when the time comes. You'll know when your part in this scene comes up, right? Am I a drunk stripper? You're a stripper. Sober? You're the, you're a stripper at the end of her shift. Am I the smartest stripper in the club? You, you, I'm going to really give you I'm going to give you comedic license to take this wherever you want. Okay. All right. So, you're so Now those buttons just snap, right? So you could just rip that shirt off in one smooth motion, right? I could. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. could. I've done that. I'm not I'm really lazy. How do you think I take off this shirt? <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. So That's a, that's you knocking on the door. Okay. Now, what do you want? Uh, I've got a delivery here for uh, Crystal. Oh, my God. I can't deal with this right now. I just got tased by this cop. <laughs> I shat myself in the back of his cop car. What do you want? Oh, my God. What's that smell? I I've got... Shut up, Shirlene. Shut up. Get back on stage. Okay, I don't want to tell you how to do your job, but you're really not supposed to tell people their real names. That's what kind you... of a breach. What do you want? Uh, I've got I got to take this delivery. Uh, it says it's for Crystal. Can I have that pizza? Do you have $12? Oh, I'm dizzy. I think I have brain damage from that taser. I'm pretty sure that's not how tasers... I, I just abused my wife and then went on the run. I'm so drunk. Should probably uh, this is get, not. I'm gonna, get out of here. I'm gonna call the cops here. But I'm really, I really wanted some. Things. God damn it, uh, Shirlene! Shut up. And scene. I think we nailed that one. <laughs> that wasn't weird at all. Think, First take. I think we nailed that one. So what's going to be really weird is how my wife upstairs reacts to me yelling, <laughs> Shirlene. God damn it, Shirlene! Put you right. Sure, by the way. Uh, you're you're correct. I should not use her real name. Shirlene's stripper name is Candy, mm. but I, I you know my, the character I was playing was not in his right mind, having been through a previous ordeal in Josh's sure. story, and he knows her personally. That's correct. Right, right. So, that was a choice I made there. Uh, so I that feels pretty good. I feel like we know each of us. I feel like. Uh, our acting strengths and weaknesses really shined through on this <laughs> on this episode. Well, let's be fair. My strengths and your weaknesses uh, really really shown through. That's the Jimmy curve. Yeah, right I'm, there. I, I, I'm, I'm telling you guys. I've been improvising for two years. I'm not fucking amateur at this. Come on, I mean, I've got training. Uh, so no, no, uh, you don't become a professional by spending money on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, some would disagree. Uh, That's the kind of quick wit you get from six years of stand-up comedy experience. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Jimmy Curve. Once again, I'm Jimmy Putnam, Joshua Vossler, Candy. <laughs> Thank you and good night. <laughs>